And uh, we're going to pray, and we're going to get into our mini study. I do have to watch my time because I have to drive out to uh, Radium uh, there. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, Almighty and Everlasting God, we come to you in humble awe. You are the one true God, and there is none other like you. So come, we pray, bless our hearts, our minds as we study your word. Send your spirit into our lives so that we may grow in love and in grace, so that we may go forth into all the world proclaiming your gospel so that others may learn of your saving grace. All this we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so being Trinity Sunday, um, you know, it, it is important, I think, uh, from time to time to make sure every, of us, every one of us has a uh, proper understanding of the doctrine of the Trinity. Now, real quick, let's see, Heather McDonald says, what is a good resource for gaining knowledge on the social justice gospel and how to refute it? So, all right, so so that you know, uh, social justice is, uh, is it's a kind of an insipid thing because it plays off of real justice. We, we as human beings, we recognize that there is a, as a real thing a, a injustice. Uh, the, uh, the, as far as a good resource on this matter, I would have to actually think about that because um, I, I would want somebody, I would want you to read somebody who is who at least understands what social justice is, isn't engaging in just pure rhetoric to over, over uh, to refute it. Uh, but uh, but uh, would look at it is you know in a way of trying to understand where people are coming from, and then give a biblical basis for why it comes up short as a movement. And I would note that uh, that John MacArthur has done some work on this, and Phil Johnson has. Uh, but I always have to say those guys are Calvinists, so you have to you have to you got to you know I, I I love Phil Johnson. He's a good friend, but uh, we we have some sharp disagreements sometimes. But I would point out that what he what Phil Johnson has noted regarding some of the deficiencies of the social justice movement, and you'll kind of see this is that what it does is it 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 convicts people of sins that they haven't committed. And what it ends up doing is – and then it doesn't offer an absolution. There is – it is only a condemnation thing. So, uh, when the, so when you look at social justice as it relates to like critical race theory, all right? So critical race theory comes out of the Frankfurt School – and uh, and and really, it 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 it's, it has its basis in kind of Marxist theory in socialism and stuff like that. But the 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 way it's manifested in our time is that that if you are merely white, if you are white, and especially if you're a male, um, and then throw into boot that you're a Christian white male, then you are automatically a racist. You are automatically a racist. And uh, and and so we've we've got a problem here because the fundamental assumption behind racism is that there are different races. There isn't. As Christians, we recognize that all of us come from the Trinity. All of us have our gen our genesis from Adam and Eve. We're all directly related to that. So there is only one one race. So already we've got a problem because. Um, you know, we we got an issue here. So then, if we if you want to talk about maybe there's a tendency towards biases uh, related to people who have the same ethnic origins that I do, um, we could talk about that. Uh, but what ends up happening is is that everything is then filtered through power, and this is kind of a postmodern mindset. Everything has to do with power. So we are the oppressors. Uh, if you're a white male Christian, you are the oppressor, and everybody else is the oppressed. Well, the thing is, is that that is just not how this works. Okay, so uh, the idea here is, is that I'm okay with somebody pointing out there there are ways in which you, Rosebro, have failed to love your neighbor and 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 talk about all the different neighbors that I have. So you can talk about it in those terms, but this is not how they talk about it. And I would also note that uh, kind of the big cry right now. Um, is is they're saying no justice, no peace. Well, okay. Um, so basically, what they're ba- they're basically saying is is that we are, go- are going to engage in social injustice unless we get the outcome of justice that we want or demand regarding what has happened regarding uh, George Floyd. But the the reality is this: is that um, when we look at the, at, you have to look at the narrative that's coming out. Of, of, of the African-American communities within the United States. And they have a compelling case that we must address. 
And the compelling case is that uh, there is systemic uh, police brutality that they are suffering, and they can point to instances, uh, George Floyd just being one of them. There's a whole series of, you know, so when when they're shouting, you know, say their name, say their name, say their name, um, they're referring to uh, a, a series of not only men, but also women uh, of the African-American communities who are dead right now, who should be alive. And uh, and what ended up happening is they had a run-in with police with one with, for one reason or another, and they were unarmed. And and so you you think of the uh, the the gal who was killed by the police officers, who uh, who were serving a knockless uh, warrant, which you know so the, you know so they were knocking on they didn't even knock on the person's door they just barged right into their apartment building, and uh, and the 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 lady's boyfriend shot at the police officers not knowing that they were police. And uh, they fired back and killed this woman. And, uh, and it turns out they had the wrong address anyway. They, they, you know, there were no drugs in her house at all. And, and so this is a woman who should be alive today, who isn't. And my question is, since when did they start coming up with knockless warrants? Okay, wh- how is that? How is that? You know, a situation that's not going to create death. Okay, that doesn't sound right to me. So the so but the issue is is that they take all of these instances and it gets rolled up into the overarching narrative of critical race theory and social justice and uh, and their claims that there still are lingering forms of systemic racism within the United States that goes back to uh, the time of uh, of slavery here in the United States and especially in the post-Civil War America. Now, rather than having a civil conversation about this, what they're actually doing is engaging in in, in ideology and basically tarnish it, saying everybody who's white is a racist and you you have privilege. You know, you, 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 you whether you recognize it or not, you you the reason why you're doing well in the society is because of privilege, you because of white privilege. And their their primary focus then is in, on how they've experienced police brutality, people who have uh, who have died after having a run-in with police over traffic violations or whatever, and uh, and and the terrible things that have happened, and so rather than being willing to sit down and having a conversation, now it's it's devolved into this social justice, anti-social justice, alt-right, weird rhetorical battle that's taking place. And what's missing in all of this is any kind of anchoring in the law of God. So I, I find it fascinating that the people are rioting and they're holding up uh, George Floyd as, uh, as an example of a wrong that needs to be righted, but they're not saying it in the way that I can embrace. For instance, you know, uh, you know, so there's, you know, there's pictures of George Floyd with the protesters out there saying, you know, Black Lives Matter. And of course, other people, well-meaning, are, are, are responding, well, all lives matter. But the thing is, is that both of those rhetorical slogans are falling short in some manner. Now, I, what I haven't seen, and I've been looking for it as I've been watching the news, are people who have a, a, a poster that says, thou shalt not kill. I want you to think about that for a second. Could you imagine how different the whole thing would take is if the, somebody had made a poster, an image of George Floyd, and they had said, thou shalt not murder, right? Okay, taken the commandment, thou shalt not murder. And their protest was that he was murdered. And I believe personally, after watching the uh, uh, the video of uh, the arrest, I uh, my opinion at this point, and, and I have to say it like that because, you know, in the United States, someone is innocent until proven guilty. My opinion is that the video of the arrest of George Floyd, uh, I believe that a murder took place. That is what I absolutely believe, that that man was murdered. Uh, that the uh, the force that was used on him was not only unjustifiable, that it was over the top and proved to be deadly. I, you know, it's like, you know, and, and so uh, the, the retaliate, you know, the, the people crying out for justice in this case, I think they're crying out for it properly, at least at the core. But the thing is, they're not saying thou shall not murder. They're saying all, you know, that black lives matter. That's and see that's a that's a different rhetorical spin on all of this and one that I as a Christian 
And uh, as somebody who's careful to, to note what we have to look at is a standard that we can all agree on. It is absolutely clear that the purpose of the government, and I know I'm doing a little mini study on this right now because the, the reality, Heather, is I do not know of a book off the top of my head that addresses this biblically. Um, Romans 13 makes it very clear what the purpose of the government is. So Romans 13 says, so let every person be subject to the governing authorities. There is no authority except from, for from God. Those that exist have been instituted by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed, and those who resist will incur judgment. Now, this does not mean that we have to bend the knee to a totalitarian government. That's ridiculous. Uh, for rulers are not only a, are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. Would you have no fear of the one who is in authority? Then do what is good, and you will receive his approval, for he is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain, for he is the servant of God and an avenger who carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoer. Therefore, one must be in subjection not only to avoid God's wrath, but also for the sake of conscience. So this is why then we pay taxes and things like this. So so I think you can make a case that, uh, that something wrong has gone on here because a man who was not armed, he was murdered by a police officer. And granted, he was he was high at the time, but being high doesn't warrant the use of deadly force for the purpose of arresting somebody. So we could point to this and say, listen, the government here has stepped out of line and gone beyond its uh, its mandate from God, and it is a mandate from God. They are to punish the evildoer. And so we must take into consideration then the claims of injustice on the part of police uh, from those coming from, uh, co- you know, from uh, communities that are primar- primarily ethnically black, and their claim that they are being made to fear the police even when they have done nothing wrong. Now, that's a problem, all right? And so that has to be addressed, but it has to be addressed outside of the concept of social justice. It needs to be addressed under the – what is the mandate for the government? The government is to punish the evildoer. The government is not to oppress or uh, people who have done nothing wrong. And um, I've been pulled over a few times in my life for traffic violations, and I have never had a police officer knock me to the ground and hold my neck until I passed out uh, you know, well, you know, for being pulled over for a traffic violation. And there are instances of this that have taken place that are readily available on the internet, and the, the, the African-American community is saying, we are in fear of the government because they are acting in a way that they are not punish, merely punishing evildoers, they are, they are treating us all as criminals. And so there, there's something that has to be addressed in that manner. So, but the, the solution for Christians, we've got to come at this dialogue with a set of ground rules, and the ground rules has to be the law of God, and the ground rules also have to be uh, what is the role of the government, and where and where uh, where the law of God has been broken, we have to say that uh, that regardless of uh, of whatever, however much melan- melanin, you know, the, you know, the 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 the. the the stuff that makes our skin either you know dark or white, it doesn't matter how much you have of that or not. Uh, you know, if you've broken the law, you've broken the law, and then there's you know, and then there's an appropriate response on the part of the government depending on what the crime is, uh, the, the presenting crime at, at the time. But uh, you know, so there's issues that have to be addressed. But the the reality is the rhetoric that is taking place is making it impossible for there to be sane conversation about. What really appears to be real problems in our society, and so I I do not believe for a second that I am a racist merely because I'm white. That's just nonsense. And anybody who says something like that needs to take a class on uh, exactly how justice works, because uh, in, in our jurisprudence, somebody is innocent until proven guilty, and what they assume is guilt, and there is no way of proving innocence. 
Okay, so I am I am a racist merely because I'm white, which is nonsense. Okay, that's that's not, that that's just ridiculous. Okay, so there is no sense of justice. Somebody's innocent until proven guilty. There is no process by which somebody then in social justice, there is no process by which somebody can go through to be able to defend themselves against particular charges. And in their way of thinking, and, and this is sad among many of the social justice elite, there is no absolution. There is no absolution. There is only power. And so the way it works out is, is that um, wh- what, they, what they'll say is you, are, you, you, are, uh, it, you, you have privilege because you, because you have white power. And so the solution to them is you abdicating your power and giving it to them. Okay? And, and that's their definition of justice. So already we got some big problems, really big problems, because uh, all of their assumptions are wrong, and the way they are prosecuting this is ideologically based, not biblically based. So uh, we as Christians, we have to bring a biblical, uh, some biblical parameters into this discussion, and note that there is enough blame to go around on both sides. That uh, you know, when it comes to sin, but uh, the church's job, by the way. Is not to, is not to punish the evildoer. The church's job is to proclaim the gospel so that the evildoer can be forgiven and absolved. So uh, we've got to recognize that that in all of this too. So anyway, I think you kind of get the idea. That, but uh, so Heather, so good question, and my apologies for my rambling answer. Uh, but uh, anyway, you, you get the idea. So all right, Elizabeth says I often use three candle explanation for those who don't get the Trinity. Uh, separate candles, uh, th- uh, three wicks. When flames are put together, it becomes one flame, but still separate candles and wicks. What do you think? Is this okay? Elizabeth, I'm going to say this. When it comes to the Trinity, every metaphor breaks down. <laughs> every ev- every one of them breaks down at one point or another. I, I, I recognize that uh, you mean well in this. And it, I mean, even St. Patrick used the clover, right? Um, but uh, even that one breaks down at some point. So every analogy that we have here will at some point break down. So keep that in mind. So um, Heather says, I like Phil also. I'll definitely look what he said on social justice. Thanks. Okay. Uh, my my children are needing me, so I'll be leaving. Bye, Jenny. Okay. Thank you very much. And then Eric says, in Oz, the same thing happened to a fellow in jail. He was a local boy, and, and I know some of his family, five years old and still no justice. They are using... Uh, Black Lives Matter to have protests here against uh, COVID-19 restriction, restrictions. Yeah, see, that's ideological. Uh, melanin, thank you, MJ and Carlos. I, yeah, yeah I, I just reach into my, uh, into my bag of words in my mind and sometimes pull out the wrong ones. That's how that goes. Sorry for asking such a big question, deterring off the Trinity. That's not a problem, Heather. Okay. All right. Okay. Uh, it's okay. We know you're Canadian. Got it. All right. All right. So real quick here. Now, I'm going to give you a resource in the chat window. I'm going to give you a link. And um, and this the link is there for everybody to see, and it's the one that says www.blueletterbible.org. Let me show you where that link takes us. And uh, this is a, a a great resource online regarding the doctrine of the Trinity. The doctrine of the Trinity is is explicitly taught in Scripture, although the word Trinity itself does not appear in Scripture. Trinity is a word that was coined that uh, captures or encapsulate what the Bible teaches regarding the nature of God. And so, um, let me do it this way here. I'm going to see if I'm going to uh, uh, holy. Trinity um, graphic. Let me see if I can find uh, something really quick. Here's the one I want. Okay, so the uh, the image that I use when I teach people the doctrine of the Trinity, and let me see if I can find one that's a little bit bigger. Um, let's see here. Let, that'll work. Open image in new tab. Here we go. Okay, this one even has a fancy Gothic font. Woohoo! So that it's got to be holy. It's got to be right if it uses a font like that. Anyway, so so basically the idea is this: is that there is one God, and and so this kind of works out propositionally. Scripture explicitly teaches that there is one God. There are no other gods. Uh, there, gods plural just don't exist, not in the truest sense. And I'll show you those texts. And yet the scriptures explicitly say that the Father is God, 
that the Son is God and that the Holy Spirit is God. There are clear texts that all say the Father is God, the Son is God, the Holy Spirit is God, and they're smattered throughout the Scriptures. But the other thing is, is that one, the other thing we know is that the Father is not the Son, and the Son is not the Spirit, and the Spirit is not the Father, and the Spirit is not the Son. It's weird how that all works, because here's the thing, they interact with each other. All right. So Jesus says he's going to send the Spirit while Jesus also prays to the Father. And so, you know, so the idea then is, is that how does a being like this exist? I don't know. <laughs> you know, I, I have, I have, you know, but this is so what the idea is, is that the doctrine of the Trinity is merely to say the same thing regarding the nature of God, which he has revealed about himself in Scripture. And you'll also note that the Holy, that, that God also prefers uh, male pronouns for himself. That's a really scandalous thing to say. But anyway, uh, you get the idea. So in the, uh, in the resource that I gave you, uh, Dr. Robert Bowman, who uh, used to work for the late Walter Martin and wrote a book on the doctrine of the Trinity back when Walter Martin was alive, and he did a lot of work against the Jehovah's Witnesses in that regard. Uh, so you, what ends up happening is, is that this is kind of the outline. And uh, you can follow this resource, and it's just a great one. If you want to do an exhaustive study on the doctrine of the Trinity, uh, biblically, this is a great resource to help you do that. So I'll walk you through some of the basics here. So there are explicit statements that there is only one God, and I want to show you a few of them. Hang on a second here. Isaiah 43.10 is the one I consider to be like the the clearest, but I'm going to copy this and I'm going to go to my Hebrew uh, Bible here real quick here, and I want Isaiah, Isaiah, there we go. All right, so Isaiah 43.10 reads as follows, you are my witnesses, declares Yahweh my servant whom I have chosen, so that you may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Before me, no God was formed, nor shall there be any after me. That's pretty clear, okay? Before me, no God was formed, nor will there be any after me. So if the scripture is clear, there is only one God. Other texts that say this, Isaiah 44, 6, thus says Yahweh, the King of Israel and his Redeemer, Yahweh Savaoth, the Lord of hosts, I am the first, I am the last, besides me, there is no God. Who is like me, let him proclaim it, let him declare and set it before me, since I appointed an ancient people, let them declare what is to come and what will happen. Fear not, nor be afraid, have I not told you from of old, and you are my witnesses, is there a God besides me? There is no rock, I know not any. Well, there, that means there's only one God, right? And then here we go, Isaiah 45, 5. I am Yahweh, there is no other. Besides me, there is no God. I equip you, though you do not know me. So yeah, so that's just a sampling of the text that explicitly teach that there is one God. So then you, you'll note then that the outline also then has, uh, talks about how the Father is is called God. Now, I will say this, in all of my years of uh, dealing with and addressing heretical teachings, I have yet to see a, a single heretical group deny that the Father is God. I have, <laughs> I have yet to see that group, okay? So, you know, so, uh, so I don't spend too much time working on the deity of the Father just because that's kind of the given. That's the one that everyone's willing to give you. Where the the action is going to be at is going to be especially regarding the second person of the Trinity, God the Son, and who Jesus Christ is. And so uh, you, you've got that. And then also uh, in the Jehovah's Witnesses heresy, which is, uh, which is a modern-day manifestation of what is known as the Arian heresy, which is a denial of the deity of Christ. Christ is just a godlike creature— uh, in in the Arian heresy, but the Jehovah's Witnesses also deny that the Holy Spirit is a person, and they claim that the Holy Spirit is like electricity or magnetism. It, it, the Holy Spirit is a force; it is an it, not a he. And so that's kind of a fascinating bit there. So uh, we'll we'll take a look then. At how then do we look at uh, Jesus being God? And so you'll note 
that there are explicit statements regarding Jesus that he is God. And I'm going to just give you a few of those so that you can see how this works. All right, so we'll start with one that is highly contested, but still, it, we, we own it, <laughs> is, uh, is uh, John chapter 1, verse 1. And I'll show you the correlation between this and the first, uh, and the first uh, sentence of the Bible. So John one one. This is like the Genesis one of uh, of the New Testament. John one one says, "In the beginning was the Word," and so uh, in our case, uh, in the beginning, ain, you know, it was ain was halagos. Logos here. You've you've heard the uh, you've heard Jesus referred to. And by the way, if you ever hear anyone refer to Jesus as the Logos, slap them for me, okay. You know, gently, just gently, and say, you, you need to learn Greek, okay? Because it's Omicron, Omicron. It is not Omega, Omega. So it is pronounced Lagos. It is not Logos, all right? Just so you know, that's the proper way to pronounce it, Lagos. So Christ is the Lagos. In the beginning was the Lagos. Kai Halagos and Halagos, the word, was proston theon, was with God or face to face with God. And Kaitheus and Halagas, and God was the Word. So let me read it in the English. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Now, so here's how this works. Remember what we confessed in the Athanasian Creed. There are, you know, the Holy Spirit is infinite, the Father is infinite, the Son is infinite, yet there are not three infinites, there's one infinite. Okay, right? So you'll know in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. How many gods is that? One. <laughs> you go, well, how is that possible? I don't know. We're, deal- we're talking about God here, okay? So, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God. Now, let me give you another text, but before I do that, let me show you the correlation then. Uh, so, when John 1.1 1, 1 references in the beginning, okay, that's an important theologically charged statement. And the reason why it is a theologically charged statement is because that is saying that the universe that we exist, that we live in, it had a what? A beginning. What was there before that? Well, there was no before. Because <laughs> time and space, <laughs> you, you, you can't talk. Okay, before that, there was just eternity. And eternity is, so time and space is a is a creation of God, which has a beginning. So your cross-reference for this, then, is Genesis 1. And the first sentence of the Bible is screaming Trinity, by the way. Okay, so here the the uh, the Hebrew here is on the left hand side of the screen, and I'll read this out for you and point out the important bits here as as it relates to the doctrine of the Trinity because it's it's there in this first sentence. So here we've got the first word be. Be means in uh, in Hebrew. Next word reshit beginning. So uh, so in the beginning, and then we have our our verb bara. Uh, and bara means to create, and this is a third person singular verb which means that the 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 noun that is doing the verb should be a singular noun a, a proverbially a singular masculine noun but it's not okay this is where it gets weird so better sheet bara in the beginning and you can say he created but then what's the noun elohim elohim is the hebrew plural of the noun God, which is El. So this this one reads weird. So Bereshit bara Elohim. In the beginning, he created. Who created? God's created. God's created what? Eth ha shemayim va'eth ha eretz. God's created the heavens and the earth. So how is it possible that the verb is singular, but the noun is plural? Answer, the Trinity. <laughs> so the very first sentence of the Bible is screaming at you, Trinity, Trinity, Trinity. And of course, we heard those words, uh, you know, that uh, when it came to the creation of man, what did God said? So Elohim, God's said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea. So here we've got the Trinity discussing amongst themselves. God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit saying, let us make man in our own image. Now, uh, along these lines then, also consider Isaiah uh, chapter six. This is kind of uh, uh, this is uh, you know, ancillary stuff, but I'll show you some other clear stuff in this in this 
regard. In the year that King Uzziah died, Isaiah says, I saw the Lord, Adonai, in this, in this particular one, sitting on a throne high and lifted up. The train of his robe filled the temple, and above him stood the seraphim. Each, each had six wings. With two he covered his face, with two he covered his feet, with two he flew, and one called to another. And here it is in the Hebrew, kadosh, 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 holy, 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 the triple holy, uh, Yahweh Sava Oath. Um, uh, so Melo Ha Sifim. Yeah. Anyway, I've, I've gone beyond all of this here. Uh, but uh, you know, Kadosh, 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 Yahweh Saba Oath, and then the whole world is filled with His glory. All right. So here you got the triple Kadosh, the cri- triple Holy, which again kind of screams Trinity. But then coming back to Jesus Himself. Consider in this regard John chapter 20. So the day of the uh, the resurrection, if you remember, Jesus appeared in the upper room, and uh, when he appeared in the upper room, uh, you know, that uh, the disciples were all there and they were happy to see him, but Thomas missed the first meeting and he said he wasn't going to believe um, that unless he saw Jesus. So John 20, verse 26 says, eight days later, his disciples were inside again. Thomas was with them, although the doors were locked. Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. And then he said, uh, put your finger here, see my hands, put out your hand and believe and uh, place it in my side. Do not be, do not be disbelieving, but believe. And what does Thomas say regarding Jesus? Thomas answered him, my Lord and my God. Okay, and in the Greek it says "Hakurios mu kaiatheosumu." You are my Lord and my God. All right. Um, so Thomas just confessed Jesus to be his God. Now, if Jesus isn't God, what's he? What's he obligated to do at this point? Go! Whoa! 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 Slow down there, Thomas. Thomas, I'm just a man, just like you, right? But he doesn't. What does Jesus say? Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Believe what? That Jesus is Lord and God. All right? So you, you get the idea. So there are, there are plenty of passages then, and uh, the study that I've given you will help flesh that out. And Jesus himself even invokes the divine name, I am for himself, which just about gets him stoned in uh, John eight fifty four. Uh, many things I have shown you for the Father, from the Father, which of these do you stone me? Uh, not for these, but for you being a mere man, make yourself God. Okay, <laughs> interesting stuff going on there. But other texts we have that explicitly describe Jesus as being God. Um, and so uh, let me give you another one that this is kind of, that a lot of people are not familiar with. In the Gospel of John, uh, not uh, Gospel, in the book of Acts chapter 20, in the books of Acts chapter 20, uh, we have the Apostle Paul giving his kind of like last words to the uh, pastors in the church in Ephesus, and, uh, and he gives, gives some kind of word of warning to, to them. And so in verse uh, 26, it says, Therefore, Paul says, I testify to you this day that I am innocent of the blood of all, for I did not shrink from declaring to you the whole counsel of God. And so he says to these pastors, listen to this, Pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to care for the church of God, which he obtained with his own blood. And so let me just ask you real quick, can you tell me when did God bleed? <laughs> um, well, um, on the cross, right? That's kind of the idea. But then also a clear confession regarding Christ's deity is found in Colossians chapter 2. And here's what it says, um, starting at verse 8, See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit, according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world, not according to Christ. For in him the whole fullness of the deity dwells bodily. You catch that? In Jesus, the whole fullness of the deity dwells bodily, and you have been filled in him who is the head and rule of all authority. So in Christ, the whole fullness of the deity dwells bodily. This then jives perfectly like with a text like in Romans uh, chapter 1, where it says that um, 
Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God, which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures concerning his son, who was descended from David according to the flesh, but was declared to be the son of God in power according to the spirit of holiness by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord. Now, by the way, when we say that Jesus is the son of God, we are saying that Jesus is God. That's exactly what the scriptures teach in this regard. So let me give you another text along these lines so that you can see what's going on here. Um, Oh, I'm in Romans. Hang on. John, John 5. I want John. There we go. All right. So here we got this interesting thing where Jesus is uh, condemned for healing a guy on the Sabbath. I mean, can you you believe that? I mean, just healing a guy on the Sabbath. <laughs> so uh, so, uh, so there's these uh, Pharisees at this point who are trying to figure out who broke the Sabbath here. Uh, so uh, so they, they ask this fellow, you know, who's, been, who's carrying his mat uh, on the Sabbath. They say, it's not lawful for you to take up your bed. But he answered them, the man who healed me, that man said to me, take up your bed and walk. So they asked him, who's the man who said to you, take up your bed? He says, now the man who had been healed did not know who it was, for it was Jesus had withdrawn as there was a crowd. And so Jesus found him and said in the temple and said to him, see you are well, sin no more, so that nothing worse may happen, happen to you. So this guy rats on Jesus. And so the man went away, told the Jews that it was Jesus who had healed him. And this was why the Jews were persecuting Jesus, because he was doing these things on the Sabbath. But Jesus answered them, my father is working until now, and I am working. And so this is why the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him, because not only was he breaking the Sabbath, he wasn't. He was breaking their rules, not the rules of God regarding the Sabbath. But he was even calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. Okay? Now, another text in this regard is also helpful, and that's in Philippians chapter 3, uh, 2, sorry, 2. Philippians chapter 2, in what's called the Christ hymn, Here's what it says, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interest, but also to the interests of others. So have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form, Morphe here you can translate as by nature, although he was by nature God, he did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but he emptied himself by taking on the form of a servant. Being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. And you'll note that uh, that this this whole analogy, this mindset of Christ that we're told to hold up, wouldn't make any sense if Jesus wasn't by nature God or equal with God. You know, so for instance, um, um, if I were to say to my wife, "Honey, I, I've decided that I am no longer going to consider myself equal with God." Would she consider me to have done something virtuous by saying that I no longer consider myself equal with God? She'd say, you're an idiot, because you were never equal with God. (laughs) So she would never, she would not consider that to be virtuous. She would consider me to be, you know, kind of moronic. But note here, Christ is by nature, he's equal with God. And the, the beauty of the incarnation is that he emptied himself by taking on the form of a servant. Although he was king of kings and lord of lords, he is found in the form of a slave. So we are to consider others as more equal than ourselves. That's the whole point of that text. And then a, a, a text, I may have done this recently in, uh, in the Kongsvinger class, but Romans 10 is a very, very helpful scripture because in Romans chapter 10, 13, he uh, Paul cites Joel chapter 2, verse 32, and in this regard, this is a very helpful thing because uh, Joel 2, 32 is talking about Yahweh, about the one true God, and so when we confess that Jesus is Lord, we're not saying Jesus is my boss um, or Jesus is my manager. When we say that Jesus is Lord, we're actually confessing him to be God. That's the point. So note that what Paul says, the scriptures say, everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. There is no distinction between Jew and Greek, for the same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing his riches on all who call on him. And then he says, for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And the reverend here is Jesus. 
So if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, that's verse 9, and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. So the question is, what does it mean to confess that Jesus is Lord? Well, answer, that's found in the cross-reference that Paul uses in verse 13, uh, and that cross-reference is found in Joel 2.32. So when we pull that up, Joel 2.32 in particular, uh, let's see here. Okay, so um, do do do. All right, here here it is. So I will show wonders in the heavens and on earth, blood and fire and columns of smoke. The sun shall be turned to darkness, the moon to blood, before the great and awesome day of Yahweh comes. So here we've got the divine name being invoked. All right, Yahweh. Yahweh is the name of the one true God, and it shall come to pass that everyone who calls on the name of Yahweh shall be saved. So note, the Hebrew text says Yahweh, but here's the thing. What Paul does in Romans 10 here then is saying in verse 13, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. That's to call on the name of Jesus. So Jesus is Yahweh. He's the Yahweh of the Old Testament. He is the God He's the, he's the God of the Old Testament in human flesh. You know, in him, the whole fullness of the deity dwells bodily. So those are examples of text. And let me do this. I'm going to do a quick word search. Great God. Let's find this. Um, here it is, Titus 2, another great text. The, uh, the, uh, the heretic, the late heretic uh, John Shelby Spong hated this verse. By the way, he, he, he railed against this verse every opportunity he had. Titus 2.11, the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people, training us to renounce ungodliness, worldly passions, to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age, waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Well, uh, that looks like Jesus is our great God and Savior, because <laughs> he is, right? So another great, great text, all right? So those are like your go-to text in defending uh, and embracing the fact that Jesus is God. So remember uh, the, uh, the, the, uh, the graphic here. So nobody challenges that the Father is God, but in the study that I gave you, there's plenty of passages that say the Father is God. And now we've looked at uh, these texts that say that the Son is God. Uh, anyone unconvinced at this point that the Son is God, <laughs> you know, our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ? Okay, so the Scriptures make it clear, yet yeah, there's only one God. There are, there are not multiple deities. Now, before I get too far, let me check questions on this so I don't get past everybody. And uh, Elizabeth says, can we use the term Godhead? Yes, people do use that term. Um, I do find it to be a term that is a little bit uh, fuzzy in, uh, in, in how to nail it down and define it. So I personally don't like to use it, but I do not think that somebody is erring grievously if they do. So uh, that, that's this personal preference. I like tighter language that is more specific, and I find that Godhead can be a little bit confusing. Tony says, what do you think of F.F. F. Bruce's study book, The Gospel of John, I think Walter Martin once mentioned the Trinity being triplex, not one plus one but plus one, but one times one times one times one. Yes, Walter Martin did uh, use that, uh, that analogy of multiplication. And again, every analogy, including that one, has some flaws in it. So there is no perfect analogy. And I understand that when we when people use analogies like that, they're trying to help somebody grasp the concept. But note this, that the clever heretic will always find the flaw in the analogy uh, to shoot down the doctrine of the Trinity. So just make sure that it, you, you make it clear. It's an analogy. It's kind of like this, but it, it, the, even this analogy has flaws. There is no perfect analogy. Okay. One is Pentecostals, uh, Carlos and MJ say, use Isaiah 9, 6 to argue that Jesus is the Father. Can you please explain that verse? As we know, that's not the case. What does everlasting Father mean? So in this particular case, to say that Jesus is the everlasting Father is simply to basically say that he is, he is one member of the Trinity. Okay. And you'll note that what you end up doing, and let me kind of put it to you this way. 
is what heretics do is they take unclear passages and they use them to obliterate the clear texts, okay? So we'll note that to call Jesus the everlasting Father, our cross-reference would be where Jesus says to Thomas, where Thomas says, show us the Father and that's enough, and, and Jesus says, have I been with you this long, Thomas? Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. Now, that doesn't mean that Jesus is the Father, but the idea here is that Jesus is the same God as the Father. And so th- so there's your cross-reference, and yet Jesus is very clear that it he prays to his Father. So, um, so, uh, yeah, so let's see here. Uh, Father, think. Okay. And I want Gospels. Hang on a second here. Uh, let me go that, that direction. All right. So, no, Matthew eleven twenty five. At that time, Jesus declared, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and the understanding and revealed them to little children. So, no, Jesus prays to the Father. And the oneness Pentecostals, what the problem that they have is, is that if Jesus is the Father and the, and and also the Spirit, because oneness Pentecostalism teaches that that the Father is God, the Son is God, the Holy Spirit is God, but they are all different manifestations of the one God. All right. So w- sometimes God manifests as the Father. Sometimes He manifests as the Son. Sometimes He manifests as the Holy Spirit. But we've got a problem, and that is, is that Jesus. Praise to the Father as being somebody who is different than him, even though he is the same God as him. And so what's the Oneness Pentecostal's explanation for all of this? Well, Jesus is engaging in some kind of theatrics. But then I would also remind you that uh, the Holy Spirit uh, and the Father show up at the baptism of Jesus. Um, And this is an important bit here. So uh, Matthew 3.13, Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to John to be baptized by him. John would have prevented him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and do you come to me? But Jesus answered him, let it be so now, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he consented. And when Jesus was baptized, immediately he went up from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and coming to rest on him. And behold, a voice from heaven said, this is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. So the one that's Pentecostal has a problem here because there's the Son in the water, and the voice of the Father is heard from heaven. How do you explain um, well, uh, you know, so God's engaging in some kind of theatrical, uh, appearances here and, uh, and, uh, making it appear as if there's a distinction between Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, uh, as far as persons are concerned when there isn't. If, you know, so oneness Pentecostalism falls flat on so many fronts, but that's, that's the gist of it. So, uh, your cross-reference is going to be where Jesus says that he and the Father are one, and and so and that's referring to the the them being one by virtue of them being God. Okay, Elizabeth says, and the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And John uh, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. The ESV, and we have seen His glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. I would note this that. Uh, that uh, only begotten, I think, is a better translation of monogenes in uh, John one fourteen than the ESC's translation of only. Um, and, and so I have, I, I would say that uh, I would, I would favor the King James uh, translation of monogenes in John one fourteen over the ESV's translation. And you'll note, as somebody who knows the biblical languages, I. I exercise the prerogative to do that because I know what the texts say in their original. So, Athanasian Creed, can you help me understand the text? The Father is not made, nor created, nor begotten by anyone. So this is Stephen. The Son is neither made nor created, but begotten of the Father alone. The Holy Spirit is of the Father, the Son, neither made nor created, nor begotten, but proceeding. I struggle with with being uh, begotten and the Holy Spirit proceeding. It's confusing since all three are eternal. So here's uh, Stephen. I would note this, that this is one of the earliest ways in which the the, uh, the Church distinguished the persons of the Trinity, and it distinguished the persons of the Trinity by noting words that were unique to the, those persons. So, for instance, uh, if, if finding words that are unique for the Father only 
is uh, is a um, is a challenge. So the the Athanasian Creed picks up on a formula that the Church ancient used to use: that the Father is not created nor begotten. Begotten, by the way, does not mean that that Jesus has a beginning. It's just a word that's used about Jesus. That's monogenes. And so the Son then is neither made nor created. So this is an important th- thing. But it is said of Jesus that he is monogenes, that he is begotten, that he is the only begotten of the Father. So what does it mean, begotten of the Father? We're not exactly sure how to explain it, but begotten is a word that is used only of Jesus, only of the Son of God. Begotten is not a word used of the Father, and it is not a word used of the, of the Holy Spirit. Now, there is a word that is used of, of, uh, in Scripture regarding the Holy Spirit that is not used regarding either the, the Father or the Son, and that word is proceeding, and so uh, or, or proceeds. So you'll note then that uh, begotten and proceeds are words that are uniquely used for either the Son or the Holy Spirit, and not the son, and and then that's the point. So when the uh, when the Athanasian Creed uses this formula, not made or begotten, and then begotten, and then proceeds, it's trying to basically say that scriptures do say things that uh, about the Holy Spirit that it doesn't say about the Son, and about the Son that it doesn't say about the Father or the Holy Spirit. That's the point of those distinctions. Okay, so. Uh, God, the only begotten one, Christ. Yeah, that's that's Jesus. That would be Jesus is the only begotten one. Yeah, and uh, and and that's only true of the Son, not of the Father or of the Holy Spirit. <laughs> Elizabeth says, "How on earth does Judaism explain the plurality of God in Genesis?" Oftentimes, they will say that uh, this is uh, this is kind of a majestic use of the word of the plural, which means that God is just really great. That's kind of the, it's it's kind of a majestic use of Elohim, and I find it to be suf- completely insufficient. And I will say this: that biblical uh, scholars and uh, biblical theologians uh, of Judaism prior to the incarnation of Christ, so you know, second and third century before Jesus was born, noted that there's a plurality within God. They they see it in the Old Testament text; it's there. And so uh, you have to read some older Jewish scholars on this. Uh, you know, in the, but they do recognize that that exists in the uh, in the Old Testament. Okay, so uh, Carlos and MJ. So we also see Christophan- Christophanies everywhere in the Old Testament pointing to the deity of Christ. Oh yes, we do. The fourth man in the fire with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. That's a great example. Also, uh, read about uh, about the the angel of the Lord's appearance uh, with. Uh, uh, with the parents of uh, of Samson, okay, that's a great account in the book of Judges, and uh, and there's no mistaking it. There, that's God who was there, okay. So Elizabeth says, "Is there an order to the Trinity?" Uh, I would say that the, the Athanasian Creed makes it clear that none is before or after the other. It is a kind of a human tradition to that goes back to the uh, Great Commission where we refer to the Trinity in this order when Jesus says, baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So we follow that order of the doctrine of the Trinity uh, in in ordering them because Christ has given that in our baptismal formula. But again, the Athanasian Creed makes it clear, none is before or after the other. So uh, they are they are co-equal. All right. All right. So, uh, yes, indeed. Two powers and the two powers in heaven. Okay. Now I have to do this. I have to stop here because <laughs> I, I physically have to drive to another church and it takes me a, a while to get there. And I, if I show up late, then the divine service starts late and people get really grumpy at me. So, uh, <laughs> but, uh, I would say this, the, uh, the text to go to regarding the Holy Spirit being God, I believe it's in Acts 5. It's the, Yes, it's the story of Ananias and Sapphira. If you want to see the text related to the Holy Spirit being God, it's very clear that, uh, that Paul, uh, Peter uh, says that they lied to the Holy Spirit, and in so doing, they lied to God. That's the text that you want to go to, and there are other passages that describe the Holy Spirit as being God. So there you go. All right, so peace to you, brothers and sisters, and Lord willing, if I'm still breathing, we'll have a divine service and Bible study next week as well. Hopefully you'll be able to join us. Peace.